Hello, everybody. Uh, Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Uh, this is one of those rare moments where I am doing a live stream specifically for the Black Voice and some of the extended channels and platforms connected to the Black Voice. Uh, recently, I've been doing a lot of recorded videos that I upload and I share when it comes to issues with the Black community. Now, I'll live stream the stuff that I have going on in business and business opportunities, motivational, inspirational stuff, but I've been doing a lot of recording, but I wanted to actually go live. I wanted to talk with you guys about something that is prevalent and has been prevalent in the black community for some time. And that is the profit on black death and how far it extends. And I just want to kind of talk about it because it's something that we need to address. It's something that we need to be aware of. Uh, before I get into it, I want to remind you, we are in the midst of a fundraiser. If you believe in the work that I've done over the last 30 years, if you believe in uh, the research, the programs and development of systems that have come out of that research, uh, Black men lead uh, the programs for domestic abuse and childhood, sexual abuse, mental health. Um, and if you aren't familiar with the work I'm doing, there's a link in the description box that you can click and go to our site and just check out what we've done. Or you can simply Google me and Google the Odyssey Project and you'll get to see the work we're doing. But we are in the midst of a fundraiser. We do need your support now more than ever. The recent uh, videotaped murder of Jordan Neely has once again ignited a racial divide that supposedly does not exist in America. We are in a post-racial America. We are constantly told that. And I even see some of my brothers and sisters pushing that narrative and suggesting that racism is no longer an issue. Uh, the entire caste system that, that, that underwrites it, the foundation of this nation is a racial caste system. Everything is set up to be, to impact one group differently than the other. Uh, one group benefits heavily while the other group tends to suffer. Um, we're not talking about bigotry here. We're not talking about whether someone likes you or not, or is mean to you or not, or calls you the N-word. We're talking about systematic statutes, laws, policies uh, that are in practice um, whether stated or unstated, that produce and, and allows us to predict the outcomes of almost everything that we see based primarily on the race. Um, so uh, that's the first thing that we have to be aware of is that that, that comes to, to the forefront every time it happens. And I, I made a video telling you guys about the fact that at the time I made the video, um, Daniel Penny, the white male who choked out and ultimately killed Jordan Neely on the F train in New York, um, was formally charged and had to be arraigned. And they immediately launched a defense fund because he's a Marine. He's a hero. He's constantly being labeled. This is a part of the process. Think about it. Whenever something happens and a white person does something to the black person, the black person's past is dug up um, and the white person is um, sanctified, so to speak. They go through a process of making them white as snow. They're a Marine, a former hero. He served his country, all these things. And the bottom line is no matter what background you come from, there are people within that background that come from that background, from Christians to Islam, uh, from poverty to riches that have done some pretty foul stuff. So saying somebody is a Marine is and, and, and expecting that, well, it works. So I guess they can expect it. But the idea that because he's a Marine, he can't do anything wrong is absolutely ridiculous. We see uh, it all the time. What I find to be interesting is... Uh, hello, Cheryl. Uh, what I find to be interesting is this whole big push for the Marine when this country treats its veterans like crap, except for when they want to use their connection to the military to 
uh, inoculate them of suspicion and so much more. But I'm, I'm, I'll get to that in a minute. But anyway, that's the first thing it did. It, it, it made us have to step back and once again acknowledge that we're not on a level playing field, that things are not OK, that there is a distinct difference and there is a deport, de, disproportionate impact on situations like this, depending upon uh, the race of the victim and the race of the perpetrator. This is real. It has not changed and I don't see it changing anytime soon. What our responsibility is, is to develop a capacity and agenda and the economic power to apply consequence to negative behavior like that. We can't ever experience true liberation and true power from a position of poverty. We are going to have to learn that we're going to have to invest in ourselves as individuals, as families, as communities, and as a race with a specific agenda in mind. If we don't get to that point, we're never going to... Uh, achieve the power and liberation and freedom we talk about we are going to have to take action we're going to have to be engaged we're going to have to be involved that's the reality of it but let's talk about this profit uh thing that really bothers me and and it came to to bear in uh when i really started to break it down and study it uh in 2014 when mike brown was killed uh Mike Brown's killed. There's this talk about charging Darren Wilson. They start raising a fund on GoFundMe, raise over $500,000 before GoFundMe falls under the pressure of people who didn't feel it was right for someone who had killed someone to raise money on the site. So they folded and said that you couldn't uh, raise money to defend yourself against criminal charges of anything. So that policy took that away, but he went somewhere else and raised money. And from my understanding, we end up raising over a million dollars. Now you go fast forward and uh, the white cop who shot Walter Scott in the back five times, same thing. George Zimmerman, who killed um, Trayvon Martin, same thing all the way up until Daniel Penny, who choked uh, Jordan Neely to death. He, at the time that I uh, first did the video a couple of days ago, he had been charged, he had been arraigned, and he had they had started a uh, defense fund on Give, Send, Go, I think that's the name of it. Um, and at the time I did the video, it was 48 hours after the initial launch of that fundraiser. He had already raised over a million dollars. He's over two million now. Two million dollars for a defense against a wrongful death, basically something that's probably going to amount to a manslaughter charge. We won't get the murder charge. Just simply not going to happen uh, because they're going to say it's going to be hard to argue intent. To me, anybody that knows that I can choke you out in 30 seconds and holds on for an additional 15 minutes, uh, has an intent to kill and it should be a murder charge, but we're going to see, I don't even remember what the indictment is, but he's definitely been indicted. And so, but $2 million. So let me tell you how the profit stream works. Now it's not simply, okay, he has $2 million. He's going to hire a law firm to represent him. That law firm is going to charge him because he's going to go out and get the best he can based off the money he has. So he's going to get charged nice. So they are going to eat off of the death of Neely. He's going to defend himself off the death of Neely. He's also going to build notoriety and a name and recognition and a hero status because he's white and he killed a black supposed predator who wasn't bothering anybody, by the way. But he's going to get hero status. You got to think. George Zimmerman killed Trayvon Martin after the uh, 911 operator begged him not to engage him. He engaged him armed, knowing he was armed, and provoked him. And when he caught them hands, he retaliated by killing that kid. And he's still walking around. I got a problem with that, first of all. He's still walking around. And 
enriching himself off of killing, quote unquote, a black thug. This kid wasn't no thug. They, but what did they do? They went and found pictures of Trayvon on the internet shooting his fing the two fingers in the air. You can find that with almost anybody that age, but they did it. They made wearing a hoodie a sign of being a thug. And I'm pretty sure when Champion, uh, and that's who created the design for, of the hoodie, Champions, I'm pretty sure when they did that, that they weren't saying, let's go make some, make an outfit for the thugs in the nation. But that's what it's classified as. You're wearing a hoodie, you got to be a thug. And so it literally has gotten to the point to where, okay, so now everybody that is going to eat from that table is literally profiting from the death of Jordan Neely, the lawyers the investigators that the lawyers will hide, the experts that the lawyers are going to pay to come in and testify. All of these people, and I guarantee you they're going to be white, are eating from the death of black blood. And this consistently happens. And we consistently get upset and then go back to, to the norm because we don't want to contemplate what the true solution is. We're going to have to take action. We're going to have to create enemies. We're going to have to be willing to take a stand and make moves. And, and, and we're going to have to weaponize the black dollar. That scares the hell out of black people because we're so fixated on being accepted. We're so fixated on presenting the part. We want to be viewed as successful in their world. And so we are buying the Mercedes, we're buying the Jordans, we're spending time in Louis Vuitton way too often. And then what happens? Somebody dies, we're doing GoFundMe's because we're not preparing and building the way we should. Now, I want to take this time and reiterate something that I reiterated when I first addressed this whole Jordan Neely thing when it first came down, is we have a problem in the Black community. We have a problem in America. We have a homeless problem in America, regardless of race. For a country that constantly boasters being the wealthiest nation on the in the world, our homeless population and our inability to get a handle on mental health issues within the homeless community is absolutely absurd. Uh, there is no real true efforts. There are all these nonprofits that, again, are bilking money and paying astronomical uh, salaries to the people who run them, and nothing is actually being done. The population, the homeless population is growing. The mental health issues are becoming worse. And then what do we do when one of them emotes in our space and disrupts our utopia? We choke them to death. We ignore them and pretend they're not there until they get close enough to where we can't ignore them. And then we say we fear for our lives from something we created. Now, this wasn't just any homeless person. Because I'm a black man, I identify as black before I identify as anything. Before I say I'm a doctor of anything, before I say that I own XYZ business, I am a black man. The one thing that I can never remove myself from is my blackness. I can denounce my degrees. I can denounce my businesses. I can denounce my Faith, faith affiliations, but I cannot denounce my blackness. It precedes me in every space I enter into. It's the first thing people notice. You can tell me race doesn't exist. Bullshit. First thing that people notice when I walk in a room is my blackness. Regardless of race, they first notice my blackness. So since that's the most powerful identity, most prevalent identity, now my mind and my heart and my spirit, those things are more prevalent, but people aren't judging that on, on top. So if the first thing that people sees is this, then it's the thing I identify as. Now, how I represent that blackness to me is what gives me power because I'm a representation that blackness doesn't have to be dangerous to itself. Blackness does not have to be foul to itself. 
blackness does not have to walk in constant criminality. I am uh, an expression of, yes, we make mistakes because I've made some, but we know how to recover. We know how to build. We know how to come up. So in essence, if in my blackness, I have to recognize that that homeless person on that train that was choked to death was a black man. You can't change it and you can't change the dynamic that created it. You can sit up and gloss it over all you want to. You can sit up and call all the stats out about how many black people were killed by black people. And it still does not change the fact that that person died unnecessarily at the hands of a white man. I can't be gaslighted. I read. I can't be gaslighted. I've put thousands of hours of research into understanding this. I don't look at things on the surface. I ask why. I look at and I study. So you can't come at me and gaslight me with, quote unquote, the black on black myth. Well, Doc, aren't we killing each other? What about Chicago? What about uh, Wilmington, Delaware? What about D.C.? What about New Orleans? I'm not denying we don't. I'm not denying we have a problem, that fratricide is an issue, that domestic violence is an issue, that intimate partner violence and intimate partner homicide is an issue within the black community. I've said it for years. I've made cries for years to get support to address the issue. It's addressable, but it's still an issue. And I'm not denying it. What I'm saying is because that is true does not exempt anyone who comes in and takes a life that's not black from accountability. We all killing yourselves. Well, let's talk about it. 85% of white homicides were committed by white people. How about we sit up and say those don't matter. So we ought to be able to come. Do you actually think that white people are going to take the argument? If one of us kills one of them that hell 85% of y'all kill each other. 85% of your deaths are by other white people. Y'all kill each other. So what should this matter? They're not going to buy, but they're selling it to us under the the, the, the banner of black on black crime. And, and, and I, I've addressed this black on black crime thing for years. And it's a myth uh, and an empty phenomenon. Uh, what I mean by that is they use the term black on black crime as if black people killing black people is some strange, unique uh, set aside phenomenon that only happens in the black community. The truth of the matter is within proximity of the people you spend the most time around. Those are the people who have the tendency to make you angry. And so what you will find is most homicides are committed by people you know. Well, we live in enclaves. Black people tend to live around black people. White people tend to live around white people. Same thing with Asians and Latin. About the high rate that it happens. Uh, that's again, proximal and uh, socioeconomic. We know that poverty increases uh, violence, regardless of race. We know that. Anybody that's st studied sociology or penology or criminal level of violence, again, isn't, isn't uh, uh, the result of blackness, it's the result of poverty. We've got a poverty issue. We can see that in the racial wealth gap. When they control 84% of the wealth in this country at a median household wealth of 180 plus thousand. If I'm not mistaken, 187,000 median household wealth. Blacks have a median household wealth of 14,000. That's a big difference in poverty, big difference in uh, fluidity and uh, affluence, a big difference in access, a big difference in resources. And so there are going to be issues that erupt within that that are going to be violent simply by the, 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 the social nature of lack. And what we won't talk about is the fact that the poverty was socially engineered. We won't talk about that. But let's get back to this. Jordan Neely thing 
And it's while I'm using Jordan Neely as an, an analogy and a case study, this is consistent with Black death. Now, the other side of this, which to me is just as atrocious, is Daniel Penny is right now over $2 million in the coffer to cover uh, legal expenses. And then I'm not sure how they have it set up, what's going to happen with anything that isn't used. Will he be able to take it like other officers have? If it is it his? So because basically what you end up with is somebody literally becoming wealthy and creating new opportunities for themselves by murdering a black person. Other people are benefiting off of it by representing the person who murdered the black person and everybody over in that particular entity. And then to make to make it worse, we do it, too. Because here comes uh, Lee Merritt and, and Ben Crump. They're coming into the family. We can get you a settlement. They come in. Now, they get a settlement, and they get one-third of the settlement. This kid is still dead. The parents have a little money in the bank account. But the voice... Of, 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 of rage is silenced. Why? Because the moment the settlement is, 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 is drafted and agreed to and signed, it silences the victim. Well, the victim's family. The victim was silenced when he was choked out on the train. But it silences the family because there's a non-disclosure cause uh, 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 where you can't talk about certain things about what happened. So now when people want to approach you for an interview, your response is no comment. Why? Because I got this money. So basically they killed your relative and they paid you to shut up about it. And this is the game that's being played. I have a problem on all fronts. I'm not saying we don't need attorneys to represent the, the families of victims who are senselessly slaughtered. I'm not saying that the families of those victims don't deserve monetary compensation for damages and, 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 and punitive uh, reasons. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that it needs to be done in a strategic manner in which we are able to effectively record that when you settle there's no deposition if you don't take it to trial if you don't at least go through the process of getting it to to trial even if you settle at trial you got the depositions on record you've got on record what happened you got it to where it can't be changed and manipulated in the future and you're building a a pattern a record of a pattern of behavior in a country that's constantly saying this doesn't happen but when you rate walk in and it's all about the money keep in mind how much they have to throw at you to sit down and shut up what they're throwing is pennies i can't put a price on a human life there's nobody in my family no matter how we getting along that you can give me a dollar amount and I say you can have them. I may never talk to them, but that life is too valuable to put a price on. And if that's the case, then there's no amount of money you can give me to shut me up. But that's what's happening. So then you have the person who kills the black person. And keep in mind, this isn't just black men. This is happening to black women too. We still haven't gotten the issue saw with Breonna Taylor. There's no justice. I'll give you another prime example. When we say that color doesn't matter, um, Muhammad Moore, police officer, I want to say in Minnesota, 
gets a call out that there's a prowler or something. He goes with his partner to investigate. White woman from Australia runs up, bams on the car. He gets frightened and shoots and kills her. He's doing 12 years. It didn't take no time. It wasn't none of that. He's a hero. He's a law enforcement. He, he It's a hard job to do. You know, uh, he acted in fear and shot before he confirmed what was going on and cost a woman her life. And it was that quick. It was over. It was done with. Flip that around. How many times have we seen it and it be the other way around? And we start the process, villainizing the victim and sterilizing the perpetrator. And the system works that way. And then we end up with $2 million is what Daniel Penny has last time I checked, $2 million. It hasn't even been five days yet, if I'm not mistaken, $2 million. It took longer than that for Darren Wilson and and uh, the, I can't think of the cop that killed Walter, uh, Walter Scott and um, Zimmerman to get to a mill, but they got there. And then look at this. And we can't even come together and build anything. And we're wondering why we're losing. It's because even at the most atrocious infractions, we have no real response but to be emotional, to verbalize our anger. We have no agenda, we have no protocols, we have no economic uh, mechanisms in place to where we can apply economic consequences to situations that will make them uncomfortable enough where they say, we can't keep doing this. We're gonna have to stop this. They're organizing, they're unifying, they're weaponizing their dollar. No, we're too busy trying to prove we fit in. We're too busy trying to prove we belong. We get angry, we get upset, but not enough to do anything about it. We throw our little tantrum and then we go back to business as usual. And it's gonna require a conglomerate effort. You can't sit in the background and just send it and say, well, somebody will figure it out. That's not how it's gonna work. What are you gonna do? What role are you gonna play? There's roles for everybody. There are soldiers on the ground. There are generals uh, st uh, strategizing. There are scholars providing information. There are uh, str uh, uh, strategic uh, geniuses coming up with ideas that needs to be think tanks, uh, observing all of the different things at play to come up with ideas and solutions. We need to create new mechanisms through which we educate our children because they are being miseducated at an alarming rate and it's causing them to be impotent and ineffective in their adulthood. And it's our responsibility to change that. I wrote about that in my 16th book, The Miseducation of Black Youth in America, and my 24th book, Academic Apartheid. We have problems. And we are failing to address them. Yes, we need to let them know what they're doing is wrong. But the best way to let someone know what they're doing is wrong is to apply a consequence to it that makes them uncomfortable, makes them think the next time before they do it. Consequence is what provides the protection against erroneous behavior. When there are no consequences, moral turpitude will only hold a few. Most other people aren't governed solely by morality. They will pretend they are. They're governed by the fact that they don't want that smoke. They're governed by the fact that they don't want the consequences. And so they get in a space where they ensure that they don't have to deal with the discomfort that comes with the consequences of doing what they shouldn't be doing. You don't have consequences. All of a sudden, it's whatever I feel like doing. And that's a problem. 
my prayers go out uh, to the family of Jordan Neely. Um, I know what it's like to deal with family members who are struggling with mental health. I also know what it's like because I literally do it for a living. Uh, I also do it as a part of the programs at Odyssey Project. It's not easy. It is not easy trying to help somebody that doesn't know they need help or is not willing to admit they need help and their life is spiraling and you're doing everything you can. And then it's compounded because a lot of times that mental illness leads to uh, coping mechanisms that drive them into addiction, which only further exacerbates uh, the psychosis and makes it even harder to get through to them to help them. And this is becoming a an expanded issue and we're not confronting it the way we need to. We need to deal with what's going on in our communities because nobody else is going to care at a level to where they're going to be invested enough to make real change happen. And that's our responsibility. It's our responsibility to say this hasn't worked for us. We need to be doing something different. It's our responsibility to say they can't keep killing our women and men. It's our responsibility to say it's unacceptable that our baby girls from age 5 to 13 are dying from suicide. It's unacceptable that we have a 49% spike in suicide for black males 14 to 24. It's unacceptable that we're still at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder when our creativity, our drive, and work has produced so much of the wealth for this country. We need to be sitting down and having real true discussions on change. We need to be utilizing the uh, information and uh, mechanisms and components we have available to us now to strengthen our position. We can't sit around and think being upset bothers people. Being upset doesn't bother, us being upset doesn't bother them. They sit up and let us throw our tantrum, have our riot, have our protest, and nothing changes because we're not moving strategically. We're not making the proper plans. We're not looking at it from an intellectual strategic perspective, and we're just acting out. We're acting like three-year-olds. It's time for us to say no longer on my watch. It's time for us to sit up and be able to look at something and know why it's happening and do something about it. It's time to give value to the minds of the people who are bringing solutions to you. It's time to sit up and say, okay, what does this mean? The, the, it's nothing more frustrating to see a problem and know there's a solution, but can't convince the people to actually act on the solution. You're contributing to your own demise in so many different ways. I said this before, and then I'm going to actually get off here. Never in the history of mankind have I been able to study and find a people so willing to finance their own demise. We will pour our money into everything white and starve the hell out of black and actually think we're doing good and actually think we're doing okay and then be mistreated and be like totally mind blown when it happens. You don't belong in this place. Not in that sense. They'll take your money, they'll smile at you, but they're showing you with what they're doing when, the, when it's that obvious, when you're sitting up and you're looking and going, I don't, I mean, you are a trained killer. So you know, that I only have to hold this chokehold to learn how to do. I don't know anybody that teaches that chokehold that doesn't teach the responsibility of it. Look, within 30 seconds, a person will normally lose 30 to 35 seconds. A person is going to lose consciousness. Once they lose consciousness, you can no longer tell the ongoing damage you're causing. You let them go. The whole thing is to end the threat. If you hold them past 30, 35 seconds and you see they've gone limp, you are intending to kill them. But yet, despite the obvious rational, rational observation of this, it was a black guy on a train being obnoxiously loud 
and belligerent. And because of that, this white Marine was justified. He's a hero. Who in the fuck was he saving? Who, who in the hell, a hero is somebody that comes along, who was he saving? For those of you who have never been to New York, what you will see on the train will amaze you. You will see movie stars, musical stars. You will see the poorest of the poor. You will see mental health people talking to themselves and talking to things that don't exist and talking to you. You will have stalkers and, and people that will sit there and stare at you your whole freaking train ride. And you're trying to figure out what the hell they're staring at. So what this guy did, Jordan Neely, wasn't new to train riders. This wasn't a first. This wasn't a oh my God moment. This was simply business as usual. And this one guy decided this is my day. And then he had a pouring out of support, not just in white trolls. Oh, they're abundant. They all over the place just going at people's posts. Uh, which speaks volumes. Um, when you take time to go on somebody else's post to post something, uh, people you don't even know, it shows you their mentality. It shows you their level of privilege and their belief and entitlement that they've got a right to do whatever they want, wherever they want, when they want. And it needs to be defended at all costs. We've got to be careful that we're not underwriting that mindset by how we move by how we think, by how we operate. And don't be gaslighted into this notion that because we have a problem with violence within our community, that it's okay to be violent towards us. Uh, no, all murders of black people are unacceptable. Every freaking black life matters. And to take one, means there has to be a consequence for taking it from the poorest person to the richest person. That life means the same to me. If the shoe was on the other foot, we wouldn't be having this discussion. We wouldn't be here. They can say all they want to say. It's not about him being a Marine. That was actually a father whose son was jumped and harmed and beaten and ran home and the people who were beating him ran in the house after him this black father killed one of them they sent him to prison so don't tell me that there's not a difference he didn't go looking for trouble it came to his house and he did what any man should have a right to do defend his house and defend his family My thing is, you 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 play stupid games. You get stupid. You get stupid prizes. You run up in somebody's house trying to harm them. Whatever happens, happens at that time. I'm not going to defend anybody of anything. If you run up in somebody's house to harm them, you get what you get. But it doesn't apply the same in the legal system. The castle doctrine, the stand your ground law, all that stuff is applied differently and it's generally along racial lines but it can also be along socioeconomic lines but it definitely does not benefit the black man or the black woman with that being said look we've got a lot to do in the way of gaining an understanding of what's going on around us how things are impacting us negatively and positively what uh levers of power we have within our reach to change a lot of what's going on in our world that we are unhappy with, that's our responsibility. But we are going to have to be willing to engage it, take action, do something. We can't continue to allow everyone to profit from Black death on any level. We can't keep doing it to ourselves and we can't allow them to do it to us either. Everyone has to be held accountable. There has to be a code of conduct. There has to be a standard of behavior. There has to be a calling on black men to defend. So 
So that's my challenge. We've got to step up. Before I get off, I'm going to remind you, as I did when this started, if you believe in the work that we've done over the past 30 years, uh, whether it's research, whether it's the think tank, whether it's programs that we've created for mental health, for rites of passage, for uh, childhood sexual abuse and incest, uh, domestic violence, and so much more, we need you to look inside the description box and choose the manner in which you want to give and support. But we need you to do that. Uh, look, on that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. Uh, thank you guys for letting me stop in on you. I promise I'm going to do more live streams uh, than record it. It's just that normally I am doing a lot of this stuff when I'm riding or when I'm sitting up at a time that I don't think it's a good time to do a live stream. Uh, like now, it's not the best time of the day to actually do it if I want uh, a huge. But uh, there's a different energy in doing live and talking and maybe having somebody like Cheryl drop in and say hello. Uh, but whatever uh, you're doing today, I wish you the best, but we are going to have to step up. And for those of you who decide to help and give, uh, I appreciate it. I thank you. Um, I look forward to doing more and more as we move forward, but we have a lot of work to do. On that note, I'm out of here, you guys. Peace. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse. Uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.